involved in a love connection inseparable to stay indescribable gift you will never take away as we are one and you're the one true God give me your love give me with perfection
If love is a giver and faith is a taker, come take from the well of life. Constant and flowing, through faith we are glowing, the giver to all mankind. Says, you see, I'm daddy's child. I'm moving faster. I'm climbing high. Oh, I'm living the good life. I'm daddy's child. trust that uh, every one of you will be richly blessed by the Word of God's unconditional love for you. Yes. Thank you so much, Paul, for having me at this conference. Um, it is, it's an honor to minister here, and it's just an honor to know you and uh, just to have met with you, you know, at the other conference, and uh, I'm sure we will just continue to enrich each other's lives. Glory to God. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you for your unconditional love. I want to thank you, Father, that when you behold man, we bring, we, we excite your mind. You, you look at us and love comes forth because of what you've made. And thank you, Lord, that you never got confused about who we are in the light of what has happened to us. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you that your, your, your hand is extended towards us and you have come to share your quality of life with man. Amen. 
Tonight I'm, I'm going to, um, <clears throat> the message will basically consist out of two parts. The first is, I, I want to talk about what happened and what is alive in the Trinity. And why God made man. And then we're going to talk about how God, after the fall of man in Jesus Christ, restored man to a place where we, beyond the shadow of a doubt, can walk with no consciousness of sin. Actually, more than no consciousness of sin, where we can walk in innocence. You know, there's something, it's something to be forgiven. But it's a complete different thing to be innocent. Yeah. No, it, it, it's like virginity, you know? You, if you've lost virginity, you can say, well, you know, it is something I had, but it's gone. If it happened in a way that it wasn't supposed to happen, you can say, I'm, I'm forgiven, but it's still gone. But when you talk about innocence, you talk about the state a baby is in when a baby is born. And God has come to restore our innocence in Jesus Christ, and He's come to do it in, a, in such a practical way that I, I believe that through me ministering this and pointing to you what actually happened in the baptism of Jesus Christ by John the Baptist connected to the cross, your mind can forever be washed from a guilty conscience. Amen. The reason why, and the reason why I believe we should have no consciousness of sin and no guilt whatsoever, and why God made it possible for us not to have any sin consciousness, is so that we can live what I call uh, in the Trinity dynamics, what is alive in the Trinity that it can that we can partake of that. Because in the Trinity, between the Father and the Son, from before time, there was never such a thing as obligation or guilt. It never existed. Jesus never woke up one morning and said, well, you know, I'm obligated to do this and this and this for my Father, otherwise my Father is going to be upset with me. Yeah. Or is going to bring, uh, uh, you know, it's going to change the Father's mind about me. Neither has Jesus or the Father had they ever known what such a thing is as guilt. They don't know what it is. It's a foreign concept to God. And in the Trinity, in the beginning, before time, there was only that absolute tranquility, that, uh, um, that, that uh, um, family relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and tonight, and I want to start off um, with this. <clears throat> Rabbi Zacharias, one of my favorite preachers, uh, tells the story. He says there was a man that was locked up in jail in China. And he got a du double life sentence, which is 50 years. He got locked up when he was 25 years of age, and he was released at the age of 75. Maximum security. And, um, you know, when a person like that comes out of jail one would wonder what is the first thing he would ask for. What's the first thing that he would want to see or say? Would he say, wow, you know, I'm seeing electricity. Or wow, look at the change that's happened in the country. Or man, we've got tar roads. We've had dirt roads. Uh, cars look like this. Now cars look like this. What would the first thing be that, 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 that a person like that would ask? And this specific man, the first thing that he asked was, could you please give me a mirror for I have never seen my face in 50 years. And when we look at that, our heart breaks. But I want to say to you, that man for thousands of years has never seen his face. Because of the veil of religion. We haven't seen our own face. We are even today scared to look at our own face in the mirror that God has provided for us. And sadly, even after Christ came, we still sit in a place where we are hiding behind the veil and we cannot see the face of our origin, the face of our birth, where we come from, why we have been made, and what God's original plan was with man. God's original plan, and I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to go a little bit into that today, was for you to share in His quality of life. And I want to explain to you what I mean by that. 
A friend of mine told me the story. He, um, he grew up in a, very, uh, in a diamond-rich area in South Africa called Cullinan, um, not far from uh, our capital city, Pretoria. And, um, I mean, there's a lot of diamonds, and, and there's a mining company called De Beers that owns all the mining rights to diamonds in South Africa, or most of it anyway. So if you would pick up a diamond, the diamond doesn't belong to you even if it's in your own backyard. It belongs to De Beers, for they've got the mining rights. So should you pick up a diamond, all you do is, you go to De Beers, you say, I've picked this diamond up, and then they will look at the market value and they'll give you the money for the diamond. That's as simple as that. So one day this lady, let's say, I don't know all the detail, but let's say 50 years of age, went and she was um, digging in the garden. And then she found this massive diamond. And this is a true story. She found this massive diamond. This diamond was big enough for her to retire, for her husband to retire, and they would have no financial worries whatsoever for the rest of their life. And she was so excited, you know, and um, she heard a knock at the door. And she opened the door, uh, opened the door and behold, a beggar was standing there and said, Ma'am, don't you have some bread for me? some food. And overwhelmed with compassion for this beggar, she went to her room, took the diamond, and gave him the diamond. Ten years later, there was a knock at the door again. The very same beggar in the same condition. Before asking for bread or food or anything, he reached into his pocket, took out the diamond, and gave her diamond back to her and said to her, Ma'am, I don't want your diamond. I want what made you give this diamond. Amen. And that's what I'm talking about tonight. I want to talk about the quality of life that's possessed by God. That which, what makes God do what He does. That is what I believe God has come to share with mankind. My view of God is... I believe in the Trinity. I believe in a, a family relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If we go and look at Genesis chapter 1, we will see the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That word God is the Hebrew word Elohim. Now, a wonderful thing that I never knew about Elohim, Elohim is not just a name of God, but it describes God. Elohim, um, the, the Elohim is the plural for God. It's not singular. It doesn't say God. It actually says, according to the, the Hebrew definitions, it says that the divine ones, more than one, created the heaven and the earth. And don't stone me when I say this, but I want to just say something that can shake your mind. The gods created the heaven and the earth. The divine ones more than one created the heaven and the earth. You know, if I come to you and I say to you, um, an American built a building, then you would say, okay, there's one guy that's really awesome and he's really powerful and he's really mighty and we can conclude uh, from this statement that he, is, he must be very intelligent and all those kind of things that can be ascribed to him for he, a man alone, built a building. But if I say to you, the Americans built a building, it implies relationship. It implies the sharing of knowledge. It implies, um, you know, sitting down together, planning, strategizing, uh, communicating with each other. It implies, to make a long story short, some form of relationship. So here the Bible says that the divine ones which we know is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the beginning created the heaven and the earth. So to me, what I see in that is that here are three beings working together, having a plan together, co-feeling, co-thinking, agreeing, in unity with each other, enjoying creating something. Yeah. They made the heaven and the earth. Okay, and further on, let's look at this relationship even in a deeper way. In verse 26, and the Bible then says, And God, Elohim, the divine ones, said, Let us make man. 
You know, you cannot never say Elohim in the, in the singular. It is impossible. The singular word for God would be the word El or Eloah. Like you would say cherub. It is singular. If you say cherubim, you say more than one cherub. If you say Eloah, you say God. If you say Elohim, like cherubim, it is the plural of God. So this being, God, three beings, yet one, come and say, let us make man. Now one of, one of the most important words there that I've discovered important to me is the word let. Let. You know, if, I, uh, if I'm at home and you say it's a long weekend and um, my wife and I and the kids, we are at home and I, we wake up on a Saturday and we had breakfast and everything and then I see it's a beautiful day and we live in beautiful South Africa, close to Cape Town area. It's really a pretty place. And I said, and, and I mean, I look at them, I look at myself, I know them, I know what they like, I know what they would like to do and I go and I say to them, let us go to Table Mountain for the day and go up with a cable way up into the mountain and spend the day there. Because it's very beautiful. Let, let us do this. What I'm actually saying is, this is a wonderful idea that I have and would you guys allow us to go and enjoy this together somewhere? Would you, would you agree with me? That's what happened there. So here is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit enjoying the highest quality of life. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. They know each other. They feel comfortable in the presence of each other. They believe in each other. They trust each other. And they're enjoying the most wonderful life, the most wonderful family life that could ever be imagined. And in this awesome oneness, they say, this is too good just for us. We cannot keep this for ourselves. Why don't we give dust the opportunity to feel what it feels like to be us? Amen. And... You know, now, now it is let us. So now we must now do something together here. We must now work together. So father and son goes and make a mud man. <laughs> and now this being must, the only way this being can partake of God's quality of life is if God indwells him. That's the only way. You must realize the life of God is so rare that it can only be found in one place, and that is in God. If God wants to share His life, He cannot break a piece of life off and give it to somebody. It is impossible. It is authentic and it is rare. There's only one such a life, and it is only possessed by Elohim, the Trinity. It's the only place you can find it. And the only way you could ever share in that life is if one of those three come and live in you. So, God wanted you, He wanted man to share in His quality of life. To, uh, um, to get back to the story about the diamond, He wants you to share in that thing that made the woman give the diamond. That's what he, what he wants you to share in. Let me tell you this way. No amount of giving away of diamonds can ever produce what was in the heart of that woman when she gave the diamond. And that is what works righteousness would be, or the law would be. The law would be, have knowledge of what you can give away, and what you can do, and the good you can perform, and by doing that, you, are, you believe and think that you can produce what is only found in God. The only way you can have God's quality of life is if He gives it to you as a gift. There's no other way in which you can ever have it. So here God comes, and I want to just explain something about the Trinity before I go on. The Bible says, and God is one. Now how can three be one? We've always struggled with that. I don't know why we've ever struggled with that, because the Bible says, and the people at the Tower of Babel were one. Was there only one man? No, no, no. They were of one mind. 
In the very same way, and, and even in a deeper way, I think in the Trinity. And let me explain that by uh, um, just bringing my marriage and my relationship with my wife into this. When I look at Helena, and I always use this example, people that listen to me, you must excuse this, this is the only example I know to explain how oneness works. When Helena and I got married, I came, my background was um, working on cars, what we, we, we would call in South Africa a grease monkey. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Working on cars, welding, doing steel work, and all those kind of things. That's what my dad did. He's never been a lazy man. He's been a hard worker. I respect him. He taught me how not to be lazy and to work. And that's how I grew up. We never grew up with any love for classical music at all. I remember one day my mom tried to put classical music on, you know, and my dad said, what noise is there? <laughs> put it off. You know, because he's trying to concentrate here and then there's this violin here in the back. You know, it's not going to work. So she put it off. And that's how I grew up. But my wife, she grew up in Pretoria and her mom loved the theater. And she would always, they would always go to the theater and enjoy the theater. She would even perform there in the state theater. So, I mean, she's got a love for the theater, but I've got a love for cars and fast motorbikes and all those kind of things. Now, when we got married, she would say, why don't we go to the ballet? <laughs> now, <laughs> so I would go to the ballet. But the reason I would go to the ballet is out of respect and love for my wife. That's why I would go, because that's what she wants. I mean, with my practical mind, I'd never liked the ballet because the clothes the men wear it looks very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just, it, it just, I, I shouldn't elaborate on this. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, so I would go to the ballet, but, I mean, she would enjoy the ballet. She would enjoy the opera. And I would go there, and I would be with her because that's what she wants. I would, wouldn't go there long-faced or anything. I love her. I've got respect for her. And as time went on, you know, I said to her one day, I said, Lovey, I want to buy a motorbike. She said, over my dead body. I said to her, but I've got a plan. Let's put it this way. Let me ask God for the money for a motorbike. And if God provides the money for the motorbike, you can't be against God. <laughs> so I prayed. Then another church, within the week, said to me, Bertie, now I looked at motorbikes and look what the payment on a motorbike would be. And in that week, a church phoned me and says, Bertie, our pastor just left. Would you come and preach once a month for us? And the amount they agreed to give me for preaching once a month was the exact amount for the payment of the motorbike. <laughs> so obviously now I can buy the bike. <laughs> so I buy the bike, but she doesn't get on the bike. But time goes on. And we love each other. And as we love each other, our hearts open to each other. And we want to know each other. We want... We want to be known by each other. There's just this union between us. And in this unity, I find that who she is, because I trust and believe in her, is actually born in me. And who I am is born in her. And then, after a while, I found that she was with me on the motorbike. And the beginning, I was just driving slowly. And after a while, she would hit me in the ribs at 100 miles an hour and say, what's going on? Why aren't we, you know? And the other day, I went to the, we went to watch The Sound of Music. And I was sitting in the opera house there. And I was really enjoying that. And that enjoyment wasn't because I got used to it. What actually happened was because of this wonderful influence we have on each other, because we are in a safe environment of believing and trust, trusting each other, who Helena was, was born in me, and I could enjoy her in me looking at that, at that uh, uh, show that there was. 
And what actually happened was she could enjoy seeing me feeling what she feels. You cannot teach that to somebody. Somebody cannot fake it. It comes through birth. And I believe this is what happened. Now, when you now look at me in the opera house, let me put it this way. Should Eliana pass away today, you will find me in the opera house again. Because who she is, is living in me. And that's why we can call, call, and call each other and say, we can say that these two people became one. And that's what I believe happened in the Trinity. There is this oneness. This oneness comes through mutual influence, respect and love for one another in a safe atmosphere that is not controlled by guilt and obligation, but mutual respect. And in that atmosphere, God has always lived. And there came a time when God said, this is so good. Let us make a being that can come and be co-seated with us and share in this quality of life. And this is how he did it. He made a mud man, and then one of the three went and indwelled that man, raised him up, and the first thing that happened to man when he opened his eyes is he was co-seated with God in the Trinity. Perfectly designed by God to fully enjoy the life that's in the Trinity. What I mean by that is, this being possesses the ability to believe, he possesses the ability to understand, he possesses the ability to know, to be known, he can talk, he can communicate, he can feel, he's got a will, he's got emotions, he's got everything, he's perfectly designed to fully experience the fullness of God. That's our design. That's what we've been made for. You know, God was not so in love with a garden that He made a beautiful garden that He ne and needed now a worker all of a sudden to work in the garden, and therefore He made a man. In Afrikaans, in Afrikaans we say, God had not a boy You'll understand what I'm saying. He wasn't looking just for somebody to work in the garden. He was not looking for a gardener. He was creating a place that is peaceful and wonderful and beautiful. And he created a man that could have a relationship with him. And then in this beautiful place that he created, which was the setting, it was just the setting wherein he would have his wonderful relationship with his man. That's all it was about. And then this man fell. And the fall... And this is how I see the fall. This man looked at all the good that was in his life, all the ability in his life, and he was, he was made to believe that he can have this quality of life that, possess, that God possess by observing all the good that's in his life and working this good. That's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is. The word evil in the Greek means to be full of labor, to be full of work. Okay, so if you have knowledge of good and evil is, you've got the knowledge of the good that's in your life, and you have the knowledge of how to work the good, thinking that you're going to have life, God's quality of life, by working good things. It would be to think that by the amount of diamonds you give away, that you will have the life the woman possessed that gave the diamond. And that is what Adam fell in. And he, 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 he went and had a relationship, not in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but with Adam, knowledge of good and knowledge of evil, and formed his own kind of a trinity. Wherein there's only death. And in that death and in that law system, the law of I am what I do, I am what I possess, Adam died. And Adam, all kinds of sin came forth in Adam. And... God's lovely man was dying. And you know, when something very valuable goes lost, it doesn't lose its value. I've got a very beautiful wife. You know, if my beautiful wife gets kidnapped, she doesn't become ugly all of a sudden. She's as beautiful, isn't it? Do I love her less because she's now in a system where she's not safe anymore? Or unsafe, or what we would call unsaved? Do I love her less? No! My love comes forth now. 
It mani- it's manifested now in a way wherein I can bring her back to, to the original place and the original plan that we had. I want to tell you, God's original plan with you was not so that you can serve Him or worship Him. You know, the only way, and, 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 and listen people, you can maybe think different than this, but people watching by the internet, this is the way I interpret Scripture. If it doesn't make family sense, it's not gospel to me. It must make family sense. No, God is going to put you through a hard time to f- purify you. Okay, let's see if I can do that with my wife. No. Go out into the, de- you know, we live in a semi-desert where we are, just north of us, and it becomes very hot. We get like 115, 118 uh, uh, degrees Fahrenheit there. Um, just like a week or two in February, we get that. Imagine I drive with a car, and my, I stop the car, and I say to my wife, would you please just check, maybe on your side on the tire there, there's something wrong there. She gets out, as she get, gets out, I close the door. She stands outside, and then I tell her, she says, hey man, what? It's, it's hot out here. I'm sitting inside, I've got the, the air conditioner running. And she's outside, she says, what are you doing? I said, my love, are you having your desert experience? <laughs> you see, uh, th- that doctrine doesn't make family sense. And then she says, hey, it's hot out here. And then I open the window like this, I say, I will never leave you or forsake you. <laughs> And then if somebody else comes by and asks me what's going on, I say, no worry, we are building relationship. (laughs) I mean, it really sounds funny if you put it that way, but that is what we ascribe to God. And then when it comes to a hard time where we need to trust, we find that there's no trust in our truster. You know, my native language is Afrikaans, so I can twist English if I like. I've got the liberty. (laughs) There's no trust in your truster. There's no faith in the faither. Because there was, there was never enough integrity of character that it could produce trust. The word trust is the word believe. The word believe is to have a mind at rest in the integrity of somebody else. So here is, 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 is God's man dying. And God says, I'm going to do everything possible to save him from his sin and the death that is inside him. The only way he could do that was, now listen to this, here is man and here is the law and death system, here is fallen Adam. The only way he could do it was if one of the three could incarnate himself into this man and then die. Then that man would be dead. Imagine he could raise himself up as a man again and then be seated here again. Then all of mankind would have this place. And the only thing we'll have to do is reveal to people the truth now. And those who believe the truth can be born of the truth. That's all. That's what we need to tell the world. So... Let me talk about how God restored everything. The baptism of John is a very, very important event that we have overlooked in the church. As I was studying this out, and I, it came to my mind on what was happening in the baptism of John and what was really going on there, it blew my mind and my heart. I, was, I tell you, I thought, Lord, I can't preach this. If I preach this, it's the end of the ministry. This truth is so great about the baptism of John. I never realized what was actually going on there. We thought that Jesus got baptized so that it could be a good sign for everybody to be baptized. That's not why he got baptized. Jewish baptism worked like this. Jews didn't baptize people years and years prior to Christ. Let's say 200 years before, 300 years before Jesus. They weren't baptizing anybody. But about 150 before Christ, the Jews started to make proselytes of the Gentiles. 
they started to make disciples of the Gentiles. And as they started to make disciples of the Gentiles, the procedure was, the first thing they did was, they got baptized as a, as, as a de- declaration confessing that they are sinners and that they needed to be washed and they would be baptized. The next thing that would happen is the men would be circumcised and after that they had a right to listen to the reading of the law. For the law was only for the Jews. That's how it worked. So, in order to be baptized, you know, you had to be, number one, a Gentile, which would be seen as a sinner. That's why you you got baptized. Then John the Baptist did the unthinkable. He went and baptized Jews. You can't baptize a Jew. (laughs) This is the baptism of the sinner. It's not the baptism of the Jew. The Jews believed that they were the people of God. They had the sacrificial system that washed away their sins. They never needed baptism. The Gentiles were the people that needed baptism. So they would come, confess that they are sinners, and then they were baptized, confessing their sins. That's why all the Pharisees, had this, there was a big thing in Jerusalem, they all went out to, uh, to John the Baptist to hear what was going on. For this guy was doing the unthinkable, he was baptizing Jews. Declaring that the Jews are equal as much sinners as the Gentiles. And that they all needed a Messiah. Now if you think that is the unthinkable, Listen to this. Then Jesus walked into that same water and said, Baptize me. And John said, This is impossible. This is the baptism of the sinner. You cannot, you're not a sinner. You are the Lamb of God that came to take away the sin of the world. I must be baptized into your innocence, Jesus. Jesus says, No, 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 no. You baptize me. Then, me and you, we, we fulfill all righteousness. (laughs) It's quiet in this church. I even hear over the internet it's quiet. But do 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 you hear that silence, brother? You can feel it? What's this guy saying? You know, they're in Africa, you know. I always heard that the marijuana was very good there. What's this guy smoking? I think this is one of the greatest revelations I've ever received. And I'm going to share this with you tonight. And I I, I trust it will touch your heart. So here Jesus comes and he gets baptized with the baptism of the sinner. What is he doing in that baptism? He's taking the sin of the whole world unto him. Where? Not in the cross. And I'm going to explain the cross. And you're going to see the cross magnified through this. But in the baptism... He takes the sin of the world upon him. He becomes the high priest of mankind in his sinful state before God. In Leviticus 16, you, you, you see the, 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 um, there's a type and a shadow of Christ. It's called the scapegoat. Now what, the scape, what they would do with the scapegoat is, they would go and confess the sin of the whole world on the scapegoat and lay hands on the head of the goat. Then they would take the goat after that has happened, after he was all, received all the sin of the people, they would take the goat and send the goat into the desert. Now here was Jesus. He got baptized with a baptism that not even a Jew in a Jew's mind could ever qualify for, for it was the baptism of the Gentiles, which says that they are the sinners. They came to confess this as yet John does the unthinkable. He baptizes Jews. For he knew that Jew and Gentile were sinners and that there was nothing special in being a Jew for God could of the stones create children of Abraham. So we all needed a Messiah. And then Jesus did what what was unthinkable to John. And he walked into that water and says, Baptize me. And in that he acknowledged that the sinless one has sin. Now where would he get sin? Your sin. That's the only place he could get it. He could take sin upon him. And then, where did he go then? Into the desert. Signifying the carrying away of sin. Then, now listen to this. 
<laughs> the place where Jesus was baptized was called Bethabara. It was on the same square foot, the same place, as where the, Gent uh, as where the Israelites went from the desert into the promised land. The very same place. When they went into the promised land, what happened was the high priest or the priests took the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant. They walked into the Jordan River. As they put their feet into the water, the Bible says, doesn't say the water was cleaved open like that. It says the water dammed up. The water dammed up to a small town, the Bible clearly says, called Adam. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know what I want to say. But well, that's good news. The water dammed up to a small town called Adam. What does that talk about? It talks about, now remember, John baptized there, declared that this is the baptism where sinners come and baptize themselves. Here, the water dams up to Adam. I believe it signifies the original sin and its flow dammed up, representing the sin of the whole world. The nation went into the promised land on dry ground, meaning they had no water on them. And they could go in because the, the flow stopped and it was dammed up to a place called Adam. And that was what Jesus Christ got baptized. I believe taking the sin of the whole world upon Him. Now you might say, but what about the cross? We're going to get to the cross and you're going to see how beautiful the cross can be because of this truth. Because without the shedding of blood, there cannot be forgiveness of sins. So here Jesus Christ comes. After that, something extraordinary happens. After he comes back from the desert, he starts to do miracles. Prior to that, he never did a miracle. Why? The Jews believed, remember this, you remember the guy was, <clears throat> um, that there was a man born blind. They came to Jesus and said to Jesus, Jesus, was it his son? or his parents' son, that he was born blind. Because the Jews believed that sickness and sin goes hand in hand. What they were actually asking is, could the sin be transferred to the child, or could a child even sin in his mother's womb? That's what they wanted to know. Because that's why this child would be blind. That's the only reason he could be blind, is because he's got sin. After Jesus healed him, he comes and started to teach them and say to them, do you also want to become followers of Jesus? Because they were really grilling him and scrutinizing him, wanting to know what happened, how did this happen, why did this happen? Then he says, why don't you ask him? Do you also want to be taught by Jesus? Then they said to him, how can you teach us? You were born in sin. For he was born blind, born blind, and born in sin means the same thing to a Jew. So here Jesus comes in the books of, book of Matthew, and he, Matthew 9, verse, verse 1 and 2, they bring to him a paralytic. Then he says to the paralytic, Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. The word forgive means to divorce or to be sent away or taken away. So be of good cheer. Your sins are not on you anymore. And then the Pharisee says, no way, can't be. Only God can forgive sins. He says, then Jesus said, listen, what's the easiest thing? To say you are forgiven or to say stand up and walk? Then they said, he is not forgiven, he's paralyzed. Jesus said, he is forgiven. They said, he's not. Jesus said, he is. They said, he's not. Jesus says, walk. <laughs> and everybody was silenced. Why? What was that miracle a sign of? That miracle was a sign of that we, beyond a shadow of a doubt, can know that the Lamb of God really took the sin of the world upon Him. And it was not just a joke. It was not just a thing you say. Where's the proof? If you want to tell me that Jesus took the sin of the world, where's the proof? Prove to me that He took the sin on Him. The problem that we have, and I believe that we've missed out why miracles happen on, 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 uh, in, in the ministry of Jesus Christ, and because we don't understand that, we've still got this thing, somebody died upon a cross, and when he died there, he took sin upon him on the cross, but where's the proof? What can satisfy the mind? What can satisfy the heart that he really took the sin? 
Here we see somebody paralyzed. He says to the paralytic, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Matthew 8.17. Now this is long before the cross. Matthew 8.17. Jesus Christ comes and He heals a lot of sick people. And the Bible says this was to fulfill what was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. He carried my sickness and bore my diseases. <laughs> When was he carrying the sickness? Even while walking on the earth. He was carrying their sickness, therefore he could declare their healing. People weren't healed because Jesus was holy. He was healed because they were holy. Jesus took their sin upon them, upon him, and he proved by miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle that the sins of people is upon him. He even spoke to a woman Caught in the very act of adultery. In the very act. Now listen, if you're caught in the act, you're guilty, man. No lawyer gets you out of that. You're caught in the very act. Eyewitnesses sees you. You were busy with the thing. You're guilty. That woman, caught in the very act of adultery, was brought before Jesus. Here was Jesus. He's called the Word of God. Here was the Scriptures by the Pharisees, and, and the Pharisees, the Scripture, comes to the Word of God, and the Scripture asks the Word of God, what is God's Word about a woman caught in the very act of adultery? And the first thing God's Word did was He didn't even speak to the woman. The Word of God removed the accusation. And after the Word of God removed the accuser, then He spoke to the woman, and He said to the woman, where's your accuser? And when the woman said, there's no one, Lord, when she had the revelation that there's no accusation, when she wasn't feeling guilt and condemnation anymore, she was ready to receive a word that could set her free from sin. And in the presence of this, he says, I also don't condemn you. Why did Jesus not condemn her? Did he not condemn her because he felt good that day? No, because there was a reality in his mind. He took the sin of the world upon himself. He took it upon himself. Therefore, the sin was not on this woman, but the sin was upon him. Ready to go to the cross with the sin of the whole world there to die. Amen. So that the man under the law could die and that the sin of the whole world can die. Yes. Glory to God. No, Bertie, but I don't know if this is true. Let me give you the checkmate scripture on this. This is going to blow your mind. Matthew 21, verse 23 to 25. They come to Jesus. They say to Jesus, Jesus, by what authority do you do these miracles? He said, answer me this question. Then I will answer you. The baptism of John, was it of heaven or was it of man? Checkmate. That's it. I'm not trying to take anything away from the cross. I want to just put to the cross what belongs to the cross. Jesus Christ took the sin of the whole world upon Himself. He walked on the earth. He did miracle upon miracle upon miracle, proving, proving that sickness and sin, which is equal in the Jew's mind, where would the sin be if Jesus heals millions of, or thousands upon thousands of people? Where would the sin be? For nobody has yet died. Sin hasn't died. He took it upon Himself. And He received the Holy Spirit as the anointing to enable him to do his high priestly duty, which was to represent man in the state that he was in, which was sin. He took it upon himself. He was the one carrying the sin. He went to the cross, and God prepared a body wherein sin could come and live. And that body was represent, representing the human race. And upon the cross the human race represented in that body died. And sin died with that body. Sin died with that body. 
Then, after three days, a new human body came forth called a glorified human body. This body was full of joy. It was a physical body. You could touch that body. You could put your hand in the side of that body. You could put your finger in the nail holes of that body. That body would go onto a beach and fry fish and eat it with people representing human beings in the new state. And that body went and appeared to disciples in a closed room and said the following words, Peace unto you. Peace unto you. Now listen to this. He comes from the Father. He appears to His disciples. Peace unto you. As the Father has sent me. What has the Father sent Him to do? To come and tell them peace. So sent I you. What must I go and do? Appear and say peace. To the world. Not the church, the world. For behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Glory to God. So here is Jesus. And He says, peace unto you. The next verse. Whosoever sins. Now I'm going to use my own words. You don't declare to them as forgiven. They will forever live with a sin consciousness. But whosoever you declare as forgiven, they will live free. And what is our job? To declare them forgiven. As He did. The only difference between the forgiveness we declare and the one Jesus declared was, Jesus could only declare forgiveness in the sense of that He was the representative of man under sin. But we've got an even a more powerful message. We can declare that it was taken away and we've got three years of proof of it and He died. So that the original plan, and this is what I want to end with, that the original plan in the Trinity where there was a platform of absolute innocence can come to man again and that man can be introduced to the original plan and the original life. This doesn't mean everybody is saved. This does not mean, I'm not a universalist saying everybody is saved. It, it would be legalistic to say, if you don't have sin, you're saved. For the law declares that if you don't have sin, you're saved. We don't believe in that. The Trinity believes when you are in relationship and in mutual belief and faith, then you're saved. Glory to God. But how will you have faith? How will you have trust if your mind in your heart is plagued with guilt and condemnation and obligation? So He had to remove it all that we can come to a place where we can for the first time again believe and have faith and so be saved from the lie, the power of sin and all the death that there is in because of Jesus. Glory to the Lamb of God. You are deeply loved. You are the pearl of great price. He desires you. He loves you. He is obsessed with you. You are His man. You're in the extension of who He is. He indwells you. You know, He loves you. He's with you. You know, if my son, if my son walks with me in the mall, and he's five years of age, just let's say my, my oldest son, he's 12, my youngest, he's 12. Imagine he walks with me in the mall and I don't see him anymore. I think, oh yeah, I know him. He's gone over to the toys department. I come there, I find he's not there. How do you feel then? Oh my goodness. Your mind starts to play a bit of tricks, but you try to correct your mind by saying, you know, he was just looking for you in the mall or in the shop. Okay, that's how you feel after you're not seeing him there. How would you feel after 10 minutes? You panic. And an hour? And a week? Your life is consumed with the life of your child. And that is the state God found himself in when man got lost. And that is the state God is still in for every person that has not believed this truth. There's, there's almost an anxiety. I don't know how to say it. There is, that's what you call the agape of God. 
the agape of God, where you lose your breath over. That's what the Hebrew meaning agab means, to breathe after, to lose your breath over. Webster declares love as uh, excitement of the mind because you behold beauty. And here you are thinking of your beautiful child, but he's gone. You're trying everything possible. You don't know where he is. You don't know what he, in what state he is in. You will spend and be spent to find him. And that's how God feels about man. That's how much he loves every person. That's how much he loves people out in the street. That's how much he loves every drug dealer. That's how he feels about every person. For nobody has been designed by God to live a life of tyranny, to live a life of torture by fear, legalism, a love for self-worth, egocentric. Nobody has been made to live that way. We, we, are, we, become a, we became a victim of legalism. A victim of finding life in our own ability. We have been designed, carefully designed. We are His workmanship. He created good works, the Bible says, beforehand that we should walk in them. How did He create those good works? By living it Himself. He lived the best, highest quality of life in the best good works there is. And He says, look at all these good works. Let's make a being that can share in this. And that is us. Glory to God. I declare you forgiven. I declare you innocent. And I want to say to you, if you have not received this truth, you can be born again. I don't believe everybody is, is, is born again. I believe in the global recreation of man from a law man to a man that can now live by faith. The one that then lives by faith is then born from what he believes in. Hallelujah. How are we born again? The Bible says, as the snake was lifted up in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. How was He lifted up? In snake form. In snake form, He was lifted up. Representing the snake and its deadly poison and all His doctrine and everything that's deadly. And any poison that is in you, when you can see that the poison that kills me is crucified, you can be born from above. That's what the Greek says, above. Why above? He was lifted up from the earth. Above. You'll be born from that above. The more you can realize your innocence and your true forgiveness to the point, and read the scripture to the point that it's not a cognitive knowledge, but where you have enough evidence in front of your eyes that your heart can be persuaded that this is, oh God, this is the only truth. That day you find that your life is born from this truth. Let's close our eyes. Father, I want to thank you for this awesome message. It truly excites me. <laughs> and Father, I know that it stretches the minds and the hearts of people for we've never heard this. And, 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 and some people can think we take away something from the cross. But oh Lord. This magnifies the cross. It gives the reason for the cross. Thank you, Father. It magnifies the new birth. It magnifies faith and belief that we can now believe in you where we were always trying to work. Father, I want to pray for every person that is here and every person watching via the internet that they will be flooded in this moment with just this absolute feeling of innocence, this absolute warm embrace of God that loves and embrace and cares for. Oh, God. Father, I, I just want to pray an intimate prayer. And I know I do it in front of people, but I know the joy that you give me. And Father, I, I don't want them to copy my joy. I want them to have that joy. With that joy, I didn't even work up. I find that you live in me, and I can feel how it feels to be as happy as God. And I thank you, Father. And this is my passion and what I preached with today, that everyone here can grab a hold of that truth. Thank you, Father. For your great love and your care for man. Thank you that this message empowers us unto a life where we don't live in sin, where we think the best of others. For we see, Lord, that we, want, we so bad want to go to heaven, but you wanted to come to us. We are your heaven. You want to live in us. You will leave heaven to live in us. 
And thank you, Father, you open our eyes to see our original design. That we can just for the first time look in the mirror and not be shocked at the beauty we behold because of your doing. And Father, I don't care if all my sins are forgiven. If I cannot believe in you, I have no life. I have no life. Father, as I cannot have a marriage if I don't believe in Helena, I cannot have life if I cannot believe in you. And thank you, Lord, that we can, you've restored faith, that we can really trust and believe in each other. Lord, I want to thank you that we don't believe for things anymore, but we can now believe in someone. Thank you, Lord. I declare these people as blessed, precious, embraced by you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for just enjoying what is in my heart, you know, together. And that we can, in this dynamics that's in the Trinity, that I can share it with you. That you can feel my heart. I can feel your heart. Amen. God bless. Thank you, my brother. For more information about Paul White Ministries and how you can become one of Paul's partners, visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. Have a blessed day and may God richly bless you.